Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of the Respawn Cree Team podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be covering the Lost Archive DLC for Revelations. And once again, we have a pretty amazing lineup for you guys. So, uh, as always, I'm Loomer, and I'll be hosting the show along with Esco Blades. So, hello, Esco. Hi there. How you doing? Good, good. All right. And joining us today also is Miss Angie, also known as Subject 17. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, and since this is going to be a very much uh, story-focused episode, we brought in two of our story expert friends from the Assassin's Creed Wiki. So first up, we have uh, Sixteeny, or Subject Sixteen, who is a community developer for the Wiki. So, uh, hello, Steven. Hey there. Okay. Uh, it's kind of cool we have Subject Sixteen and Seventeen on the same <laughs> show, I thought. <laughs> okay. I'll give her a hug later. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay, and then we also have uh, Master Sima Yi, who is a co-admin on the Wiki. So, hello. Hello. Okay. And last but not least, we have a very special guest today. Um, so he started out as a writer on Assassin's Creed 2. Um, he, and he also wrote, um, creative directed, like directed everything regarding the glyphs for that as well, <laughs> if I got that right, before moving on as the uh, lead writer for Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Uh, more recently, he wrote the Lost Archive DLC, as well as the multiplayer cinematics for Revelations, and he is currently working as the lead writer on Far Cry 3, and so we're very happy to welcome Jeffrey O'Hallam to the show. So hello, Jeffrey. Hey. Woo. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, we're all very excited. So yeah. yes, thank you for, thank you for joining us. <laughs> It's not too shabby a resume there. Um, I think, right? <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, so now we also have some questions from the community for Jeffrey that um, were submitted and voted on using Google Moderator. And so we'll be weaving some of those throughout, some of the highest voted ones throughout the episode. Um, we'll also probably ask kind of a block of them at the very end that we didn't get to. Um, and we're also going to be discussing spoilers for the Lost Archives. So if you haven't played it yet, just be careful of that throughout the show. Just be aware of that. So, <laughs> okay. So Jeffrey, um, before we try to get you to tell us all the secrets uh, of Assassin's Creed, I thought maybe you could talk really quickly about um, your role within the writing team, because I think a lot of people might hear that you know you're the lead writer or lead script writer for you know Brotherhood or Lost Archive, and kind of wonder you know what exactly that means. You know, kind of exactly what you're responsible for and how you interact with some of the other writers on the team, especially ones like Corey May, you know, he's very high profile in the Assassin's Creed uh, universe. So uh, if you could just start off talking about that, maybe. Um, we're really kind of a, a cabal. We work together on all of the plot stuff, and we were involved in it from uh, AC2 onward. Corey wrote Assassin's Creed 1 and was there with Patrice at the beginning. And Patrice really, uh, it's his universe. It kind of came from him. And so... And then Corey really brought it to life. So it was an incredible thing. And wor I worked with them on Assassin's Creed 2, and we further developed the plot. And um, I guess in terms of lead writer, like with Brotherhood, what happened was we knew where the games were going, and we know where the, the end is. And so um, with Brotherhood, Patrice and I worked on the plot of that game, um, knowing all of that, the basic outlines of stuff. And then I wrote the script. So every line in the main plot of Brotherhood, every line that you experience in the missions that are required to do, and a lot of the side stuff uh, was written by me. Um, and the database in Brotherhood was written by me too, and the and the, all the clusters. So it really was. It's the job of like uh, what you hear in the game and the the way the characters develop in the game, and then as far as the story of the whole. Um, of the whole world, Desmond in the present and all of that other stuff that's been developed by Patrice, Corey and I, and, and the other writers as we, as we go along. And, uh, like I said, it, we kind of had an overarching structure and we fit things into it. Okay, cool. So does, does Corey May these days, you know, he doesn't really lead, write these games, I think since AC one or two, right? So he's just more kind of collaborates in kind of the overarching story and then kind of, points that you need to hit within your individual games is that it pretty much uh yeah it's it's when we come up with the story we come up with it all together and there's a big group that includes the creative director and the level designers and um the 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 brand everyone who's kind of been a part of assassin's creed and uh cory's actually the lead writer of assassin's creed 3 oh what about um matt turner no he uh he's kind of like He's helping Corey with some stuff, but Corey is the lead writer. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, cool. Oh, that's interesting. No. All right. So, well, um, I guess... And, 
Oh, and sorry. we're kind of, I mean, that's how it works with each Assassin's game. There's a lead writer who writes pretty much the whole script. Mm-hmm. And then uh, other writers come in on the side and help stuff out. Like with Assassin's Creed 3, I'm doing some, again, uh, part of the multiplayer, well, actually the multiplayer storyline. Oh, cool. And so I'm writing that part, but it's Corey's game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when, when you're doing things like, um, when you're working on The Lost Archive, obviously that's Clay's story. Um, but he's also a very prominent figure in Revelations. So did you um, did you get together with Darby a lot? You know, Darby McDevitt, who wrote Revelations for the audience, um, to kind of discuss where that was all going to? Yes, it was, it's interesting how uh, the the Subject 16 story came into being, because originally it was supposed to be in Revelations itself, mm-hmm. not the DLC. And so a lot of people have been asking, uh, why was this story about Lucy's betrayal told in... Uh, DLC, and the reason is that uh, we allow creative directors at Ubisoft to have a lot of um, power, and Alex Amancio, the creative director of Revelations, decided that he wanted to tell Desmond's story in his present, not the secrets about Lucy. Ah, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. So it was, which I support. I mean, I support the creative director making whatever decisions he wants to create a game. So uh, Darby and I, I mean, I, I had known Clay's story for ages. And so this was a chance to tell it. And so uh, Darby and I made sure that it fit into what was going on in Revelations because that was Darby's game. And then um, it uh, got changed. So it was still being developed. From it, Basically, the, the Subject 16 story started out, the whole idea of having this Desmond Desmond's journey in the present started out as Desmond living through Clay's memories. And that, and it was... Uh, kind of developed as that and then um, the levels about Desmond were added in addition to the other levels and then the other levels were kept for a DLC okay. uh, that's very interesting so I, I might segue that into what was the highest voted question actually the first part of it actually was um, in the Lost Archive who is experiencing Clay's memories and the loop it seems to be Clay but it is never stated and this was from a uh, 20 glyphs it is it is Clay in the DLC, but originally it was going to be Desmond. Okay. Okay, cool. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter on some level because the memories are Clay's. I see. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's very interesting to hear about. Okay, so um, I guess, so now that it's been the Lost Archive was split off as a DLC, um, we were thinking, you know, it didn't really receive a whole lot of attention. I had a lot of friends who are pretty hardcore fans of the game, they, they weren't even aware that the Lost Archive was released. And so for anyone out there who is maybe not aware, maybe we thought you could give kind of uh, your intro to the Lost Archive and what it's kind of like supposed to be, like from your perspective. You don't mind? Uh, well, the Lost Archive is contains the revelations that uh, were missing from Revelations. <laughs> 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 um, um, it's, it's the... The Last Archive tells the story of Clay Kaczmarek and how he joined the Assassins and how he became Subject 16. And it also reveals the the truth about Lucy, which we've known for a while and have been figuring out where it was going to be revealed. And so it was going to be the grand climax of Revelations. Ah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, just, I, I did think it was kind of ironic that, yeah, it was like the biggest revelation was in the not in the Revelations game itself. <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and a lot of factors kind of contribute to this kind of thing that ends up happening, and it's unfortunate, because game development is a bunch of different art forms together. You know, you have game design, you have level design, you have music, you have story. And so um, I think what happened was the Desmond levels in the present were... I thought we we all thought they were an incredibly interesting idea, but the community uh, reacted with very mixed and kind of ambivalent <laughs> towards the idea of having first person gameplay, towards the the whole uh, creating blocks mechanic. And so once that was seen by Ubisoft in response to Revelations, then having a DLC that includes more of that becomes less cool, even yeah. though the plot in that may be really cool. Mm-hmm. You see, that- and so I think. I think that's where you get the lack of marketing of this, where the community seemed to not want more uh, levels with Desmond in the present. And then we have a DLC that contains levels about Desmond and Lucy in the present. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, we, that was something I actually I spoke to a few people about, and it was the lack of promotion by Ubisoft. Of It, it just it didn't seem to make that much sense at the time, although 
you know, with hindsight now, you kind of see how everything panned out. But um, th- there wasn't much in the way of, I mean, from the press side of things that, that I was looking at it anyway, there wasn't much in the way of any press releases. There were no assets sent out. The, you know, there, there was the one unreleased trailer. And we kind of touched upon this a bit. I mean, I don't know, from from your point of view, how, how was that a little bit disheartening, especially seeing as like, you know, you, you'd put... I, I'm not going to make it too dramatic and say your heart and soul, but you'd written this and these were some concrete revelations that weren't present in the game that was called revelations. Um, did, you know, how, how, how did you see that from your point of view? Yeah, it was, it was definitely disheartening. Um, I mean, it's kind of the price you pay to work with these kinds of budgets and this kind of, uh, universe is sometimes things end up under the bus Yeah, and, uh, it's a shame. And I really, I mean, what it says to me is I want to, it taught me that I need to push harder and harder and harder for story being the center for me of these video game experiences that we create. Because to me, the writing, the audio, the game design, the level design should contribute to telling a story and that all the different parts of a game should own story. And in this case, uh, because of all the, the conditions that I told you about, the Mm -hmm. story was less important than the the problems with everything and so it really is a shame i'm and Corey and i were both upset about this yeah. um because we really you know we planned this to be a big deal and instead it got it got it ended up in this unfortunate position yeah and i know ubisoft would have loved this stuff to have been at a cr- you know, a crowning gameplay moment, so they could have advertised it. So it's really not anyone's fault. Sure, it's just that it's just that you know when you try to do new gameplay, there's always a risk, and sometimes it doesn't uh, turn out the way you want it, and then you know whatever story is attached to that suffers. Was it? Um, I don't. I, I don't know if you can answer this, but I'll ask anyway. Was it something that was fluid in terms of? Do you have set times when you think, okay, this is a perfect time for us to extend? the story um, experience for the players? Or is it, some, is it a moving goalpost? Because the, the last Archive DLC stuff came literally just before the AC3 announcement. And I can't imagine that that was when it was originally slotted for, if, 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 if that's how it works. I mean, yeah, is that it was like one week before. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there was no lead up to it or anything. It was all of a sudden, okay, here's the DLC. It's out today. And then one week later, it's like, hey, look at this new... AC3 game. <laughs> and, and looking through my notes, actually, on the site that I write for, the DLC was revealed by way of a leak anyway. I mean, we, we got wind of some leaked achievements to start with before U- Ubisoft were pretty tight-lipped on everything up until the day before the release. So, I mean, was it, was it scheduled for that particular point in time or was it something that you were like, at some point we're going to have to do this, um, but we haven't actually fixed in a date? Well, here's what happened with the AC3 release. Mm-hmm. Or announcement. It wasn't an announcement from marketing. And Assassin's Creed 3 marketing, if you know, took a, like a month yeah. actually to re- announce AC3. What happened is Yves Guimau, the CEO of Ubisoft, announces the games that are coming for that year. Yes. And um, on some level, marketing doesn't coordinate for what he's going to say. Mm-hmm. So he announced Assassin's Creed 3. There were no details about it, but the fact that he said that it was going to happen meant that all this press started coming out about it before there were even any images, before marketing had really kicked into gear. And so uh, marketing is, was surprised by that. So it was not intended that Assassin's Creed 3 would be a big deal at that point, actually. But but I'm pretty sure... Sorry, I, I think the, the thing you're talking about with the earnings call where he revealed Assassin's Creed 3, I thought that happened before The Lost Archive came out. And it was like, it was like you know, March 5th or somewhere around then when the, Kot- the Kotaku image leaked... The Game Informer cover leaked, and it kind of kicked off that whole cycle, which obviously was the marketing thing. Am I remembering this right, Esco? Do you know um, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's just, it was... Um... I thought that was what happened a week after the Lost Archive came out. Well, regardless, I don't think there's any kind of coordination. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the earnings call where... Yeah, the earnings call where Eves sort of dropped the news, and it was actually the release date, was on February the 15th, because I listened into that. And um, so, yeah, that was that was that was that was quite that was quite early. Actually, it took everybody by surprise. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're not necessarily focusing on the AC3 in this particular podcast, but that came quite early. So well, the, the question which I kind of asked, which you kind of answered um, was, you know, 
do you have particular sort of like release windows, as it were, in inverted commas, where you go, okay, this is when we want to push Lost Archive, but maybe as a result of the CEO kind of uh, jumping the gun, you're like, okay, suddenly oh, we, we can't push it as much because we have this other game that needs to get the focus on. I think that's what happened, that everyone at that point was already clamoring for AC3 stuff, and yeah. so on mm-hmm. some level, it, this this other thing, which included gameplay that the community wasn't so crazy yeah. about, yeah. even though it contained story revelations, was less important. Yeah. Okay. It really was a lost archive then, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... It's really, it's really a shame because uh, I, th- I think we tried to do something very indie and um, experimental at, for Ubisoft. And Ubisoft has always been willing to try all of these uh, interesting experimental things. And sometimes the community just doesn't seem to support that. And I think it's a shame because what they don't realize is if they don't support something like that, what it means is that Ubisoft won't take risks and won't do things that, that the community might actually like, even though in this case uh, everyone wasn't as huge a fan of it. Yeah, I think I think it's a real shame too because like if I'm being honest, I wasn't really a big fan of the the first person platforming sequences honestly, but I thought the visual design of the game and the story especially like those two things together were incredible. And you can see that in the trailer, um, you know, the unreleased trailer that they came out for it. I think one of the reasons it worked really well for me as a trailer, I thought it was a fantastic trailer, um is because, you know, the trailer is very visual, right? And the visual design of this of the lost archive I thought was really amazing. I, and it, it feels kind of unique and, but still kind of within the world. And it, I kind of, it kind of felt like, um, <laughs> if you guys have ever been to like, you know, those modern art museums, you know, either like MoMA in New York or like the Tate modern, yeah. it, it kind of felt like you're walking through like one of those, you know, installations, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. We, we had actually talked about Daniel Liebeskin's architecture as an influence. He did the, the Holocaust museum in Berlin and he was the design for the nine 11, uh, World Trade Center site after, you know, oh, wow. for the new site and um, that jagged tower that he created. Um, he's all about kind of fractured spaces. So it was definitely thought of as modern art. Yeah. I thought that was really unique and cool. So I thought it was kind of a shame. It's like because, you know, all the other single player DLC for the series so far is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really find it that memorable, even though I enjoyed playing it more than this one. But I was glad that I played through this one and kind of experienced it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, we've, I've tried to support the DLC um, with story. Like, if you remember in the Da Vinci du- Disappearance and Brotherhood, mm-hmm. I put in the hint about New York, yeah. yes. about Assassin's mm-hmm. Creed 3's setting. Yeah. And so the idea was that the DLC should be a furthering of the story, a, a furthering of the goalposts, like you said, mm-hmm. and that, you know, people deserve that when they buy this yeah 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 cool all right so why don't we uh why don't we just jump into the dlc actually so uh you know the dlc is clay kesmeric's story subject 16 um and so i thought it would be probably appropriate to have our own subject 16 <laughs> uh, kind of <laughs> kick off the discussion about that uh about clay yeah yeah no problem um well, I just want to first touch on something you mentioned on the Frag Dolls live stream a little while back about um, the level design itself um, influencing uh, Clay's, sorry, Clay's psyche influencing the level design um, because as you progress through the memories within the DLC, his, it feels like his support system vanishes beneath his feet, lit, lit, literally, because in the first few um, memories, everything feels so concrete. And then as you progress through, um, your environment itself becomes your enemy, so it's kind of like it's reflective of his support system and his um, mental state is fracturing. Yeah, uh, that was the intention, um, because for me the the blocks represented support, and so the whole story was a, about support because the gameplay should be about the same thing that the writing is about. Yeah. So it's about the support structures in Clay's life, his parents, his the assassins, Lucy, and uh, how each of them fail him one by one, and then the blocks, meanwhile, also start failing him. Yeah, no, I I just felt that the whole kind of thing worked so well in unison because usually you're playing a game and you're in a level and that's just your environment, it's your playground. But this felt like it was part of his mental state. You're you're kind of furthering the experience of how he was. Um, experiencing his own life at that time. So I thought that was pretty important. 
Yeah, it was. And there was original design where every every uh, enemy thing that you encounter, like the lasers that destroy blocks or the fields that destroy blocks, the first time you encountered one, there'd be a plaque on the wall and it would be one of Clay's engineering experiments because he's an engineer. Yeah. And so the idea was that the things destroying the blocks were kind of nightmare versions of the creations that he made in his life. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, I suppose we could kind of tie in um, topics from his life and his relationships um especially with his father, uh, Harold, which were kind of extremely strained, kind of obviously from uh, very, very early on, he kind of didn't meet his father's expectations and he kind of never did. But also with his mother, um, I know she doesn't kind of make as much of an appearance in the DLC, but kind of uh, the split between his father and his mother obviously had a detrimental effect on him. So maybe you could speak a little bit about his kind of relationships with his parents, first of all. I mean, for me, that's the heart of the, the story. Because he had, you know, he comes from a blue collar background, and his father kind of, you know, raised the kid as a way to make money for the family, um, and he's supposed to contribute to the family. And the mother, you know, the father's very distant and uh, utilitarian in that way. And so, um, it's a sad story about how the way that you treat a kid when the kid is growing up, even though the father eventually realizes that he's been, that he's had trouble expressing his love for clay and ultimately tries to once it's too late. Um, it's about that kind of hole, that unfillable hole that it creates in a kid that yeah. the kid wants, you know, clay needs support in his life and his father never gave him that support and so he goes seeking it from other groups like the assassins and from lucy yeah. and ultimately that ends up being his downfall and so this uh lack of love as a kid really um was his fatal flaw and i yeah. thought that that was a a really interesting uh relatable tragedy to tell yeah well i i, th I think that's kind of um pretty obvious within Clay himself as a character. He's almost kind of like a Shakespearean hero, that kind of unfortunate hero that no matter how hard he tries, he can never kind of get that I ideal to that ideal place that he wants to be. Everything is always against him. And that um, in the end, uh, it even ends up being against him. So I think that's what makes him kind of so interesting as a character. And to me at least, and I've spoken to a few other community members, it makes him more interesting than Desmond. I'm not sure if that was an intention, but especially for me, I think that I connect more with Clay than I have with Desmond today. Mm -hmm. I've got to agree with well, that as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think I, I think Corey was very smart in, in building Desmond, especially at the time period that, the, that Assassin's Creed 1 came out, because uh, Desmond needs to be a vehicle for the player. And so there was this, the prevalent theory at that time, especially uh, relating to Gordon Freeman and Half-Life was that if you make the, char the, the player's character totally open so the player could be that character, then um, it allows the player to be, become more immersed in the game. Now, personally, I find um, that the more developed a main protagonist is, the more unlike the player in a lot of ways, or the more alive a main protagonist is, the more interesting they are, which you saw in GTA 4. Yeah. I mean, they really... They really that's what they did. And so for me, I think, but I think at the time that Assassin's Creed 1 came out, it was very difficult to have a main character performance. There wasn't facial mocap. There weren't, there weren't the techniques that we have now. And so I think it was really a product of that era. And Desmond comes from that. And so I, I, I think that now we're able to have characters who are protagonists that are, that are much more uh, complex because we can convey that complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then just to speak a little bit more about uh, Clay's kind of progression through the Lost Archive and the significance of um, breaking the loop, um, it's kind of, it kind of feels, well, as you're playing it, it's kind of like an, an unescapable thing that he's going through. He can't escape um, his own memories. He can't escape his faith. He kind of is fighting against things that are inevitable. So um, could you speak a little, about, a little bit about what breaking the loop um, means? Is, is it him finally accepting his faith? or is it um, something else? Um, the idea is that when you're trapped in this, uh, the inner reaches of the animus like this, that Clay's stuck reliving his past uh, again and again forever because um, 
in Assassin's Creed, technology is not necessarily a good thing. And so, you know, the Animus is this incredibly powerful, amazing machine, but at the same time, there are dark sides to it. And so Clay, by imprinting his his consciousness into the Animus, ended up being fractured, which you you put together the consciousness in, in Brotherhood in the clusters. But before that consciousness was put together, it was just left reliving its life. And so it's kind of this idea that through technology, we could pause that moment that's supposed to happen right before death, where you relive your life before your eyes. And so it just ends up looping it like a skipping CD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's really the significance of it. Yeah. So I just kind of felt like to me that it was him finally accepting his fate because in the single player in, um, in Revelations, he kind of expresses his want to leave the Animus to Desmond. And then also um, he has a conversation with Juno within um, the Lost Archive DLC that he's kind of fighting against her request to help Desmond. It's like he doesn't want to do it, but eventually he does. So it kind of felt like to me it was finally him accepting what was going to happen as well as getting control. I mean, that's just an incredible situation to be in where he's, he's being tortured by Vidic and Lucy's abandoned him. And then basically that's when Juno comes to him and asks him to help Desmond by sacrificing himself. And so uh, being confronted with that choice, I mean, neither option is a really good option, but ultimately he ends up, he ends up feeling like that what, what she wants him to do is going to help the future. So it's like, at least he can be a part of the time continuum of humanity if he helps Desmond. I I always Um, thought that was um, a testament to his mental strength, even at that particular point in time. It's like you've said, he's been asked to do something that for most people would seem an impossible situation. It's like, you know, right, so you've got to help this guy, but you've got to sacrifice yourself in the process, despite everything that you've been through. Um, It really, like, you know, as as, uh, Sixteen has mentioned, it, it, it sort of made me relate to him a lot more um, than I probably had done up until that point because you, you feel for him that, you know, everything he's then been through and then he has to do this. And, you know, I, I, I really liked, I, I grew, I grew to like him as a character a lot more after playing the DLC. Definitely. Yeah. yeah well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It was, it was, a uh, it was intense writing that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a really tragic character. You know, I feel, I feel really bad for him. You know, <laughs> after it was all over. <laughs> well, there's a lot, you know, uh, it's funny when I was writing him, I kept being reminded of this kind of semi short story called Flowers for Algernon. Mm, yeah. And that's really a similar thing where this guy, you know, is part of a science experiment and mm. he seems to get smarter. And then it turns out that the, this thing that mm. he didn't even really ask for ends up destroying him. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just those that's it's really sad and i guess it's it's uh the dark side of life you know the show breaking bad does that kind of thing too and it's it's very dark to think about it that way that that you know that a life does this to people but at the same time uh i think assassins is somewhat optimistic ironically at the end of the day that there's a small little bit that gets better in each cycle. That's the other thing about the cycle, actually, coming back to that question about the cycle. Assassin's Creed is a series of cycles, um, you know, where it's Templars versus Assassins, and then something ends up happening, and the future ends up getting, you know, it's basically like, you know, the way that Desmond keeps reliving lives of his ancestors. Each life is like one step of the cycle. Okay. And the question is whether there's a small little bit that gets better, or whether it's just the same thing over and over again. So in effect, Desmond's breaking loops as well, isn't he? Yes. So that's why it plays uh, loop mirrors Desmond's. Yeah. So I'm I'm sorry. This when he broke when Clay breaks the loop, I, I'm still not 100 percent clear on what that signifies. Unless Clay Clay doesn't really. You mean when he gets out? If you get right. out, if you get all the fragments, and he writes the email to his dad at the end. Well, he comes back. The idea was after that, at that point, you're back on the island and you can replay through the whole thing again. So he doesn't really break the loop. Oh. Um, when he ends up in the internet, and that, the note to his dad is that he's going to help Desmond. And he's going to sacrifice himself because it's possible then that the loop, that there will be a 
that humanity is caught in this loop and that the loop will uh, go forward, that there will be some kind of move out of the loop if he helps Desmond. Yeah. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Cool. Um, uh, Seema, Philip, did you have anything to ask about Clay? Uh, yeah, in Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood, he was, Clay was voiced by Cam Clark, but in uh, Revelations, he suddenly has a different voice actor. Was there a specific reason for that? Um, or... <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, um, casting decisions are made by different departments in Ubisoft, and uh, I think Cam may not have been available at that point. I, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, so you weren't involved in that decision. No, um, that was much more related to Revelations itself. So, okay, Alex Amancio and and Darby would be better people to ask that question to. Uh, I see. Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. He is, his voice is. I, I feel like Cam Clark. His voice always feels in control and like kind of authoritative almost. And so I thought that I actually really liked the new guy's voice. There was a lot of talk about Altair's new voice actor, but you didn't really hear a whole lot about um, Clay's new voice actor. But I thought the new, the new voice actor did a really good job. He sounded kind of um, unhinged a little bit, you might say, like slightly crazy. Um, yeah, he gets a different personality altogether. I think. Yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. very different. Um, you know, as much as I love Cam Clark, at the same time, it's also hard for me to separate him because I love the Metal Gear series so right. much. And, like, I started, you know, I played that one since the first one came out, and I kept expecting him to be like, brother! <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, I, th I, I felt the same way that you did, but uh, it, when you cast a character, you should keep consistency, too. So it's a difficult question. Yeah, it's a tough balancing act. Um, did you have anything else, Philip, or about Clay? Anyone else have anything about Clay they wanted to talk about? Mm -hmm. um, no, I think... Maybe if uh, Jeffrey wants to talk a little bit about um, the kind of the truth playable level from um, Brotherhood, where Desmond has that conversation with the kind of virtual Clay. Um, that conversation itself is probably a, a massive talking point within the community, especially if you have subtitles on. <laughs> yeah, we have... Because uh, if, when uh, Clay references... Um, the sun, but it's spelled S O N. Um, is that a hint towards something we can expect in the future, or is that just something to tease us with? You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I expected that. Uh, wait, uh, oh, sorry, can I can I uh, pause for one second, really quickly? Sure. Yeah, sure. Should have some elevator music to. Where is it? Yeah, we got sound effects. <laughs> That's perfect. I wonder if you guys can hear it. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I just started playing the elevator music. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, that's fine. Um, so kind of j jumping off of that point, actually, one of, one of, I think it was like the third top voted question um, from the community was from Infamous Man, who's from Perth. And his question, okay, it basically kind of summarized his question is, can you explain all of the truth speech that... Um, Clay gives Desmond in Brotherhood, but maybe we could kind of <laughs> step through this a little bit. So you're, the Sun S O N part, I guess, is already off limits. But he was asking about the Find Eve in Eden. Everything you hold dear is already gone. I guess you know there's been a lot of references already to like uh, who was it? I think Juno was telling Desmond at the end of Brotherhood that there is one who would accompany you, and you need to find her. And I'm assuming it's the same thing, um, finding Eve and her DNA. And the key, is that anything you can talk about? <laughs> there are a lot of uh, secrets in there, and uh, they were, are not forgotten. Okay. So, but um, we have a lot, a lot planned. Yeah. Um, so you'll just have to wait and see. Okay. I'm assuming pretty much that entire speech is mostly going to be relate, you know, resolved in AC3. Like, there's not really much there that was talked about in Revelations, I think. No, no, and even further, I mean, there's a lot, it's a lot of uh, stuff that is part of a much bigger journey. Wow, all right. Post-AC3 talk, even. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, I'm just saying, like, there's a lot of stuff okay. to be resolved yeah. there. All right, fair enough. All right, cool, well. All right, so for moving on from Clay, um, you know, the other big part of the Lost Archive, and probably the biggest story point that 
most people talk about is Lucy. And of course, you know, the revelation that she had defected to the Templars uh, during her time at Abstergo. Easily, I think the biggest aggregate question we got from the community, um, you know, there were multiple people that asked this in various ways. Um, but I'm going to, I thought we could kick it off just with this one. This one was, I think, the fourth highest rated question from someone called the Propaganda. And he says, Learning that Lucy was a traitor was a lot to take in and will have great significance in future installments. Was Lucy's reveal to players planned since the release of Brotherhood, or was it only thought of during the making of the Lost Archive? And maybe I'll take that a little further to kind of encompass some of the other questions, but basically, you know, when in the writing process was it decided that Lucy would uh, actually have defected to Abstergo? You know, what timeline in the series? Um, Patrice really thought of all the characters. Uh, he had a sense of what th- was going to happen with all of them. And so it was really part of the thing from very, very early on. I mean, the, the attack in AC2 on the at the end where Vidic shows up, mm-hmm. that's not an accident. So, And in Brotherhood, I don't know if people noticed this, but um, in some of the emails in Brotherhood, uh, Lucy's getting letters from um, uh, Desmond's uh, the the guy in charge of the assassins, William M. Mm-hmm. And um, if you look at the time of some of those letters and the date, um, you'll notice something, especially the letters that are sent to Lucy versus William M. is writing letters to Lucy and he's writing letters to Sean in the emails in Brotherhood. And the William M.'s are not necessarily the same. Ooh. And if you, hmm. you look at those emails, you will see the beginning of the reveal that happened in the DLC. Uh, I see. I find that very interesting. So you're saying it was, this was planned out by Patrice since like, you know, AC one or AC two or. I don't know. I I, I don't know exactly when, but I know that, uh, you know, the love, the the supposed love that was going to happen between Desmond and Lucy is kind of like building a cathedral. And for Patrice, that, breaking that cathedral in mid mid process was incredibly exciting. Huh. And so I don't know when he had the idea to do it, but it was definitely uh, in the middle of AC2. In the middle of AC2. I mean, that, that, that kind of began to be fleshed out. And uh, so it wasn't really, a, it wasn't a spur of the moment thing. And like I said, you could see hints of it, um, especially in Brotherhood, you can see hints of it. Huh, that's very interesting. I had, um, I, I thought it was kind of interesting that I, I think for a lot of people, um, they found it very, it was kind of, is we were very taken aback to find out that she had defected, um, especially because of her behavior in the early games. And I found it personally, um, it, it's hard for me to reconcile things like in the first couple games when Vidic is keeping Clay and Desmond in the Animus for so long and she's the one who's like, you need to like, you know, stop this and take care of them. And then in the Lost Archive you have things like she's when she writes her email to Clay and she says, you know, what, you know, William Miles doesn't care about like us. And you know, that's kind of understandable from her situation, but then she's like, but Abstergo does and all this stuff. And it was when when I hit that point, it was a little hard for me to reconcile the two things. I, I was wondering if maybe you could kind of touch on that kind of element to it, because I think a lot of people found the reversal in her allegiances um, difficult, if that makes sense. Well, uh, the thing about the Templars is that they guarantee control, and they guarantee that humanity will be taken care of, and that's very important, because Lucy's background is revealed in the DLC is that she was left on her own with no one to take care of her, kind of like Clay. Yeah. Um, because she was a sleeper agent and she had to be prepped to be the perfect sleeper agent. And so she couldn't interact with assassins. She couldn't interact with the, where she came from. And so she was kind of orphaned on some level. And uh, so uh, what the Templars promise is to be taken care of. And I think that's very, I think that's very important to her. And the other thing that I want to make sure of is Templars are not evil. Again, <laughs> it's this philosophy of control. And so, uh, Lucy's experience, it's not that Lucy, Lucy is a good person, and that's very important, and I tried to make that very clear in the DLC, that she does love Clay and care about Clay and want to take care of Clay, that she does care about Desmond. What she thinks she's doing 
is that once they found the piece of Eden at the end of Brotherhood, she was going to take it to the Templars and she was going to make it so that humanity is safe yeah. and taken care of. And so that's really what's going on. And I think a lot of the reactions on the forums are, I think they're taking uh, the easy approach in that they, they're thinking of the Templars as bad guys. And it's like, how could Lucy be a bad guy? And in, in my mind, that's just, that's not what the Templars are. And I think, especially as the series goes forward, you're going to see more and more about the Templars and how human they are. And so Vidic, Vidic is not a very likable person. And yeah. <laughs> Lucy, doesn't, Lucy doesn't really like Vidic. If you notice, like you said, and the way that she behaves towards him in AC1 is not, she's not friendly with him. And she's upset about some of the things going on in Abstergo. But at the same time, the opera people who you have yet to meet, by the way, <laughs> are much more persuasive. And uh, she's been promised a lot of things. And, and they're mostly things that a hero wants. She wants her, the people that deserve to be taken care of, to be taken care of. She wants humanity to be taken care of, and she wants the end of war, all of which Abstergo is promising. The assassins don't promise the end of war. Hmm. The assassins are about humanity having freedom, which means that if humanity decides they want to have a war, the assassins are okay with that, and the Templars aren't. And so if you're a pacifist and you believe in world peace or any of those things, the Templars on some level are much more... Uh, are much uh, are present a much better al alternative than the assassins. I see. Huh, that's very interesting. Oh, Thanks. Um, um, if I could kind of follow up on that, um, um, I was also wondering. So, it, so you know, we talked about when, kind of in the in the writing process, it was decided Lucy would be would defect. But I was also wondering, at what point uh, it was decided that she would be killed off, because that was also very, <laughs> like. I feel like the loss of Kristen Bell is really. I feel like stuff like the Lo the Lost Archive would have had more impact if it wasn't just an email, you know, and if it wasn't just Vidic narrating to to Lucy what she was going to do. If you actually had could hear from her in that, and um, so I, I was wondering at what point in the process she was killed off because that was definitely, you know, very abrupt. Uh, it was very abrupt, and it was very much like a very kind of mindfuck ending to, to any yeah. of the games <laughs> out of all of them, I think was the most. And so I was wondering if you had any uh, thoughts on that. Well, that, that's what I meant again by Patrice thinking about destroying this cathedral. That was the moment where he killed Lucy. It was this completely out of nowhere moment because who would build a cathedral and destroy it before it was finished? Yeah. And so that's really, uh, I think that's the moment he kind of dreamed of. And it's an incredible moment. And um, I think that, I don't know how, again, I don't know how far in advance he planned it, but it's, you know, for me, it's his world and it came from him. Huh. So, um, and I trust him. And I think, like you said, <laughs> that it, it really works. So uh, then in terms of her not being in the, the Lost Archive, the problem is when you have a, a movie star, yeah. um, if you want that movie star to do a couple of lines in something, they have a contract deal, which means that they that basically this would get treated as if she were the main character. You know, like as if she'd done all the lines in Revelations, let's say she'd like been the main character in Revelations versus doing a couple of lines for the DLC. It, it's the same, um, it, it's the same price. I see. So, and and it's not cheap. <laughs> so That's the takeaway so, from this episode: Kristen Bell is not cheap. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not. So, you know, I would have. It would have been great. You're right to have Lucy's voice in those parts, but, um, you know, again, we were doing an indie game yeah. with an indie budget yeah. for the DLC. I see. That makes sense. I, I think it was just, for me as a fan, it was kind of, you go from this ending of Brotherhood where I was like at my TV and I was like, what? Like, like what? <laughs> and then I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to like find out what's going to happen. Like, you know, is she dead? Like, why did this happen or whatever? And then like Revelations came out. It was just kind of this offhand. Oh yeah, she's dead. Like nobody went to her funeral <laughs> except for Sean, right? <laughs> and the Lost Archive came out. It's like, oh, and she was a Templar. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Well, well, I tried. I'm sorry. I guess yeah. this is all. This is my fault because oh, no. I, I tried. No, but I tried to write around. Like I, I thought that I had managed to create 
a way of doing it without her voice being in it. And so if you felt that way, then I, I failed to write it in a, such a way that her voice was unnecessary. I mean, that's, I was really trying to make it all possible without you hearing her. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I'd say you failed or anything. It's just, I think, I think we'd all agree that it would, you know, we kind of miss, I mean, I know Lucy wasn't universally loved within the community, but I think a lot of people, and I understand it's difficult to get like Kristen Bell and stuff back, but it's like you, you kind of miss that when you revisit the subject of her, I think, a little bit. And that's just kind of like all it is, I guess, at that point. But um, Yeah, it would have been nice, but again, uh, like uh, the yeah. plot points were told by Vidic. On some level, what she would have said would have been like three lines, really. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could have written it with a lot more of them, but in, in actuality, it's... You know, I think that it functions or it was conveyed without that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the, my I've seen the reaction on the forums, and I think I think I I think more than half or half the people really thought that uh, it worked, and then the other half felt like it was too abrupt, like you said. And I think having her voice would have fixed it. Yeah, I do think for that everyone. The, the the lack of her voice does kind of I, I don't know, but for me anyway, it kind of makes you then focus on other parts of that particular plot, like. You know, that, that titanic shift in, for a lot of people, what it is anyway, a titanic shift in your thinking. that So it's not so black and white. It's not the assassins are good and the Templars are evil in that you can see what she was seduced by and then you can kind of start to understand that they actually do honestly believe what they're doing is good, you know, other than Vidic, who's a bit of an asshole. But, you know, um, <laughs> you, know you, you, you can understand that they honestly believe that they are doing everything for the for the greater good so um you know in a way it kind of works differently to what uh you know uh, luma was saying in that like you know on, on the one hand the voice being there would have you know would have served one purpose but her voice not being there kind of forces you to think about other things i think anyway. well and originally uh, again this came down to production time but originally you were supposed to be following the shadow of lucy yeah throughout most of Penrose, oh, right. where you okay. think you see her and then you turn mm. a corner and it's it's a shadow of like a hat rack or something you know that kind of thing where clay is haunted by mm. lucy and then at the end in the final level this faceless lucy was supposed to follow clay and destroy what? the level uh. so basically you'd be platforming and building platforms and if you took too long the level would dissolve because this this faceless lucy in a wedding dress was dissolving the level as she was walking it towards you and so for me the lack of her voice at least in that and in that intention was interesting because it creates the specter that he's haunted yeah. by and then and then you hear her voice through the letter yeah mm. you know there there are a couple of letters in which she kind of gives her case and so if, if i think if we had been able to work the shadows into it and we'd been able to you know see that he was haunted by, by the shadow figure i think the fact that she doesn't talk would have made more sense yeah that would have been uh -huh. spooky <laughs> That would have given me but, nightmares. <laughs> but, the, but the point that you made about Lucy, about wh why her voice wasn't there, was exactly my reasoning. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think um, the kind of difficulty in accepting Lucy's circumstance could have been a mix of us as a community. Um, kind of not, we're not used to getting concrete answers. Everything is always kind of left up in the air within the AC universe. You know, nothing is ever closed off. So I suppose something being closed off so kind of bluntly was kind of surprising as a community it had to happen yeah, yeah well the game called revelations but you know, you know right exactly i mean to me it was the climax of the of the game yeah. because of that like you said the, the fact that we really did definitively did this thing it should have been the climax yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it's like but, but it's, it's it's a community like the game development is a huge group of people working together and so what i want isn't necessarily what we get yeah yeah just touching on and Stephen's point there, sorry. I think I was one of those thousands that, you know, when Lucy was dying at the end, I was like, no way, how can they? And then I thought to myself, okay, well, she's bleeding, so it doesn't necessarily mean that she's dead, does it? And so I couldn't wait to find out what was going to happen. But now that we know that she is supposed to be dead, um, are there any actual, um, like, scenarios, possibilities for her to return? 
I, I can't comment on those. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> and Tom, my only question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. I uh, we'll we'll see about zombie spinoffs. No, 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 no. no. Just turn it into a soap series. Halloween DLC. <laughs> yeah. I'll offer up. I'll offer up my voice. I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you guys have been watching Ringer at all, the Sarah Michelle Geller show that came out recently, oh, yeah. where she's got plays herself in an evil twin. I saw a trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's incredible twists in that show. Really, really incredible. But I don't know how they're going to be able to keep them up. Like they, they keep on keeping them up. And so my feeling is, if they just make make put vampires in and make it Buffy again at some point, it will be awesome. <laughs> yeah. It seems like it's a real world drama about rich people in New York, but then all of a sudden one of them's a vampire. Like <laughs> yeah. and like episode five, not at the beginning. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I, 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 at some point. If you see that happen, I'll have made it. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, did you have anything else to ask about Lucy? Or I might have hijacked some of your material. I, yeah, you kind of did, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was just going to ask about the challenges, you know, that you would have to face uh, in writing her out. Um, obviously, it was obviously a very abrupt end, but, I mean, were there any challenges involved? But it sounds like it was all quite pre-planned, so... Uh, rather than, you know, just being cut off as it was. Yeah, the only challenge was really writing the DLC without her voice. And again, like, if if all the shadow stuff had been there, I think I had solved that problem. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Because I liked also that all the characters were talking about her, but you never hear directly from her. So the idea was that, like, everyone is talking about this thing that's missing. Yeah. And I find that really interesting because there's this Virginia Woolf novel called uh, To the Lighthouse. And in that book, the main character is killed halfway through. And then the rest of the book is about the absence of the main character. Mm -hmm. And so even though the main character is killed, the main character is still the main character, despite the fact that she's gone, because everyone is talking about her absence. And so I think that I was trying to do something on a much smaller scale like that, where mm -hmm. you have this character that's obsessed about by Clay and his psyche and everything, but yet he can't face her. Yeah. Huh. But I think it's something within the community as well about Lucy is we, we will never kind of believe something unless we physically see it. Okay, we saw Desmond stab Lucy, but he didn't stab her in the neck, he didn't stab her in the head, he stabbed yeah, her in the abdomen. Uh... It's That's what that I kept almost, saying yeah, to people. It's something yeah. that the community will kind of want to keep alive. You know, something like, okay, she showed her allegiance to the assassins um, at one point. She showed her allegiance to the Templars at another point. But there's also an in-between, I feel. And especially we have kind of an organization or a person, I don't know what it is, called Erudito, which is kind of, a, of, of a, a reflection of that, this kind of mystical thing that appears every so often within the series. So at least in my head, in my fan in my fantasy, I'd like to think that Lucy is a kind of part of that gray area. Yeah, well, she definitely is. I mean, what what I find so interesting is that in her context, what William M. did to her by abandoning her and using her as this chess piece to attack the Templars is worse yeah. than what the Templars did to her. Yeah, definitely. you know, and that's why it makes sense that she would side with them because ultimately the assassins can do evil and the Templars can do evil and both can do good. And mm -hmm. so she definitely was a manifestation of that gray area. And she was stabbed, um, but uh, you know, if you, you, wait and see, who knows? <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I, I mean, kind the, of DLC, with the, the DLC just the DLC just talks about what happened to her earlier in the past. It's not about her death. Okay, That's definitely, true. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I just went mm. with a theory that nothing is true. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I saw her bleed and I thought, well, I haven't seen her actually die, so. <laughs> yeah. She was yeah. buried. What? Well, she so, was so, buried. Sean, Sean says, but Sean was the only one present. Yeah, Sean was. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I, I didn't go to the funeral, no. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> Cyborg. And Sean has, always been a, Sean has always been a character that enforces that he's not perfectly invested in the assassins he's always kind of said do you think what we do is right so sean is another kind of reinforcer of that gray area as well yeah yeah i mean it's really about the imperfection of humanity again this kind yeah. of 
the yeah. loop that humanity gets into and the fact that it's never perfect. Yeah. Um, um, Philip, did you have uh, yeah. something uh, to talk about with Lucy? Uh, yeah, well, uh, you pretty much hijacked all my <laughs> material. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and it's mostly already been discussed, so... Oh, my bad. Yeah, I think it's better to move on. Cool. Move on. Okay, anyone else want to talk okay. about... Do you see any uh, maybe maybe Jeffrey can elaborate a bit more on William's involvement in uh, Lucy's betrayal, or maybe not. Well, uh, I mean, what you know is from the DLC about the fact that he that he set her up to be this mole, yeah. and he talks about it in there where he says that he that she can't that she can only communicate for, through these letters. And uh, oh, the other thing that you remember is in. Um, in Brotherhood, there's also the thing about how Lucy easily got the schematics of the Animus out to Rebecca for AC2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 was so easy. And Desmond actually has a conversation with her about that, where she kind of evades the question. He says, "How did you that. get all this stuff out?" So that was another uh, hint. But um, uh, no, I mean that's really what what is discussed in the DLC, and I'm not going to go further than that. <laughs> but I, I, I do think that William Miles is kind of like the perfect manifestation of um, our distrust in the assassins yes. because obviously it's always been reinforced that okay it's not black and white it's not um, good versus evil and you've always kind of reinforced that over the, the games but I think William Miles the character and especially with him being so close to our main character um, him being the person we distrust the most is fairly important I think. Well, well, and I mean, that's been set up since the very beginning, if you remember, because Desmond in AC1 says that he ran away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And who's he running away from? It's William. Yeah. 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 I think William's going to throw a spanner in the works at the end of AC3. Just say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, so we, you know, I guess moving on from Lucy then, um, we talked really briefly about kind of how the Lost Archive wasn't really promoted very well by Ubisoft and they had created a trailer which was really I thought great, but they never even officially released it, as far as I can tell. Like I don't I don't think it's on the marketplace, it's not on their YouTube channels or anything like that. And this is something we had kind of discussed before the show really briefly, but I thought the people in the in the audience would also like to hear about it was I, I was talking about um, at what point you, you hear a lot of dialogue in there, I feel like isn't actually in the Lost Archive. And especially one of the kind of weirdest moments was when you hear someone, and it sounds like Rebecca, saying, Vidic, like you kept him in the Animus too long. And that was very confusing to me. Uh, it almost sounded like a line for Lucy, but I thought maybe uh, you could elaborate on that for, because I know there was at least a few people out there that were also wondering about that. Um, yeah, that was supposed to be a dialogue between Vidic and another scientist at Abstergo, where this other, like, basically Desmond, uh, sorry, not Desmond, uh, Clay um, ends up in the infirmary um, because of all of his exposure to the animus. And then uh, the doctor in the infirmary tells Vidic, you can't keep doing this. And the, Vidic says, I'm going to keep doing it because uh, I need the information. Because Clay ultimately ends up giving him the info about Ezio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's how he knows, you know, th that's how everything with Desmond happens. You know, Lucy gets Desmond out so that they can go through Ezio stuff to find the piece of Eden uh, that they get in the, in Juno's temple in Brotherhood. Yeah. So, um, and, and uh, they were looking for that. Yeah. So that, that's really what's going on. Um, it's not, if it's Rebecca, in that trailer, they may have taken a line from Rebecca that came from Brotherhood, where she does say he kept him in the Animus too long. But um, if that's the case, it's just because they wanted to heighten drama. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. But right. I know the only character in the DLC who says you, you've kept him in the Animus too long is this uh, infirmary doctor. <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot more sense because it was very like, why would Rebecca say that? And then it wasn't in the DLC, and I was like, what? <laughs> What's going on? It's so weird, but that makes a lot more sense. Um, so I guess before we move on to the rest of the community questions, I thought we'd just run through everyone here. If you had any additional questions about the Lost Archive, uh, Philip, do you want to start us off? 
Uh, yeah, was there anything relevant cut from Brotherhood and the Lost Archive that you can tell us? Um, uh, from Brotherhood, no. Brotherhood was like a dream project where uh, everything that I wrote in the script ended up in the game, pretty much. I mean, the, I think the closest, and I think this even happened, uh, if you did all the, the side, if you did the, if you solved the Wolfmen stuff, in the, the sewers in Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point where at, at the end of the Wolfman stuff where you got this, uh, you got the proof that Rodrigo Borgia had kind of created the Wolfmen to scare the people into coming back to the church. Yeah. Yeah. And then the idea was that the town crier, Ezio brings that to the town criers. And then from that point on, you will occasionally hear a speech from the town criers talking about how the Wolfmen were, were created uh -huh. by Rodrigo Borgia. And so the idea was that the player would feel that, you know, by, by Ezio's actions, by uh, doing all the, the underground levels, they had changed the world. And I'm not sure that that speech ended up in the sound banks, but I think it may have. Uh, I don't recall hearing that. Yeah, I haven't heard it either. Oh. Okay, so that probably didn't happen. So that's the only <laughs> thing. That's the only thing. And it's because, you know, all of these systems were really uh, at the beginning of game development on some level. You know, that, that unlike movies where they can easily edit any section of a movie they want, in, in order to do things like insert a speech into a sound bank, um, because of all the, lo the localization and the way the programming works, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, like, the mm -hmm. you couldn't... In Brotherhood, the the it was very difficult to, it was I guess it was impossible to insert speeches in the middle of the game. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Into the town crier's audio banks. So that kind of technical, you know, it's things that you would think would be really easy in your daily life. They end up being the hardest yeah. things yeah. to do. And things like make this make the Castel San Angelo explode is very easy. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Cool. Uh, Angie? Oh, yes. I was going to ask you um, how much involvement you're going to have in AC3. I mean, obviously not with the multiplayer side of it, but just with the story mode. Um, we had story meetings at the beginning of AC3, which I was very much involved with um, about the arc of the story. And then um, I'm doing the multiplayer story. So as far as the main script goes, I'm not involved. That's Corey completely. Okay. And it's all Corey. I mean, for, mm -hmm. for him, this is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the Assassin's Creed main trilogy. And so it's rightfully his, his baby. So I'm really excited to see what he does with it. Yeah, same. Okay. Yeah. Right. But I'm still very much involved in other AC stuff going on, actually. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're very you're very involved with the modern day story. I feel like yeah. with lots of yeah. stuff. So, do yeah. you yeah. collaborate with? You know, you have the the chain coming out, which was the sequel to the fall, the graphic novel. Uh, or yeah. Do you uh, collaborate with the artists on the story for that? The brand does overall, but really. Um, again like when i when you talked at the beginning about the structure of all this we really give all like we've created this group of people that we all really love working with and that we trust and we want to give them creative freedom and it goes for each of us like you know ac3 is Corey's story so it's his to creatively express what he wants to express uh brotherhood was mine so it was mine to creatively express what i wanted to express and uh revelations was darby's so it was darby's to creatively express what he wanted to express and so um we don't rein each other in very much. Yeah. Uh, we all know the general parameters that we're working within. And the same is true for the comics. Yeah. That, uh, that, that it's really an opportunity to, um, I guess, dance within this world we've created rather than be, you know, chained up. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's good that you mentioned the comics actually, because that's what, one thing I wanted to ask you. And it's really about sort of like transmedia. So sort of outside of the game world as it is, you have the comics, you have, well, Ember's the short film and stuff, and and recently speaking on sort of like another franchise within Ubisoft, sort of like Ubisoft Motion Pictures. How important do you see transmedia in in the AC universe from this point onwards? Oh, it, it's going to be very important. I mean, I'm very excited by it. Yeah. This dividing again, like what I'm doing with the DLC by dividing story fragments up, mm -hmm. so that you get different ones through different media. I think that's really, really cool. I mean, the downside of that, that uh, 
it's something I'm trying to solve personal at a personal level is you know people mention oh it's not fair that if I don't buy the comic book then I don't really get to know what's going on and I feel like I've missed something yeah and uh you know not everyone likes each medium I I think the goal should be that it's all entertainment it all should be really good yeah and you should want to read all of it and um ideally we find a way to pat it gently for people who miss various pieces of it but you know, at some point, if if uh, we put plot points in the comic book, but then we like re-explain those plot points That's in the main true. games, then reading the comic book becomes irrelevant to forwarding the plot. Mm-hmm. And so it's a push-pull. You know, you you want to put enough new material into all the transmedia stuff that it that uh, they're an integral part of the experience, but at the same time, you don't want to put so much that people who didn't use them or play them or watch them feel left out. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so, so do the so do the UB Workshop team sort of? They don't necessarily sit on any of the actual teams that you guys are involved in, but they, you guys obviously pass ideas back and forth and stuff. Is is that really how it works? Or yeah, I mean, it's really uh, within the the core of the brand. We all throw things around to each other, and it's very open. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yes, We're, but but again, each team has a lot of autonomy on their own. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right, Stephen? I have one question, but I'm going to kind of ask it with the acceptance that you probably can't answer it. So I'll take it as a personal request from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Clay is a character, someone that I've become um, really attached to, and I know a lot of other people have as well. So um, in my head, I'd like to think that there's a possibility for a game to take play, play as a prequel that features Clay as our protagonist because he's obviously had a lot of time in the Animus to explore his ancestry and also there's kind of interesting dialogues that we've been kind of hinted at with him speaking with Juno and also him exploring his ancestry with Adam and Eve so um, it's kind of like an ideal scenario I'd like to see Clay return obviously he can't come back from the dead but in a prequel in some way so um I know you probably can't answer anything about that, but just take it as a personal request, if nothing else. <laughs> I, I will, and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, though. I'm, I'm really, I'm really uh, glad you liked him so much. It was really a pleasure to write him. Yeah. Well, I, I named myself after him, so. <laughs> <laughs> you do a, a hint. Yeah, I think he's pretty well liked in the in the community as a character, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, so I guess with that wrapped up, we can hit some of these last community questions before we finish the end of the episode. So why don't we just run through some of these. Okay, so the first one we've pretty much answered. Um, The second one is from Bauer Zero from Poland. And he was saying, so, okay, so this is kind of like a revelations question, but it involves clay. And so I, I hope it's appropriate, but you can let us know if that's something that's more like Darby's territory. But... He says, and this is also forward-looking, so you probably can't answer too much, too, but he says, so at the end of ACR, does Clay or his animus self die slash get deleted completely? What was the purpose of him hugging Desmond, then? Will we see something more of him in the future? Uh, We never, we have not closed that door, so, uh, yeah, that's all I can basically say, is that um, that moment in Revelations is... um, is an honest moment, so let's see. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Yeah, <laughs> Steven's very happy. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, moving on. This is another question from 20 Glyphs. I'm skipping past some of the, pretty much all the Lucy stuff I think we've answered. So um, the propaganda from the U.S. asks, I'm sorry, not the propaganda, 20 Glyphs asks, the community has found encoded messages in all of the lost archive memories except for memory three, which is titled Abstergo. Is there a secret message in this memory? Uh, I, I'm not going to say for sure, but um, Abstergo is a very polished, clean, sterile environment, so it's quite possible that there is not. Okay. He also adds that he loves the cryptographic elements in the truth in the lost archive, and he hopes to see them continue. So. Um, I, I do as well, and they will definitely, uh, I think, as long as I continue to be involved with the Assassin's Creed franchise, you'll see more stuff. Awesome. awesome. Great. Okay, next one is also from Tony Glyphs. He has a lot of good questions here that were voted up. So, <laughs> next one is, uh, can you explain why Ezio was 
quote, remembering something else when he hid the apple in brotherhood and why his memory of defeating Cesare was kind of corrupted. How do the memory within a memory hints and subject 15 fit into this? So just to refresh the honest's memory, because I had to go look this up because I had completely forgotten about this whole scene. This is when the crew arrives, the modern day, you know, Desmond, Lucy, Rebecca, Sean all arrive at Monteregioni in the present day. And they're talking about they need to find the memory where Ezio hides the apple. And then Rebecca says, oh, like we can't just jump straight to it. It's like he's remembering something else. And then they talk about the memory within a memory talk. And subject 15 was someone that kind of had that uh, same behavior because she was pregnant. And the fetus had memories from both the father and the mother that were competing. So I guess, can you elaborate on all that? The idea was that... uh... What's going on with, with Ezio's stuff is that he can remember things and you experience them as playable mm-hmm. um, because they're in the animus. So Ezio, like what's going on is Desmond is reliving memories of Ezio and then Ezio occasionally remembers something. And when Ezio remembers something, you, you experience it. Yeah. So that was the idea that she's talking about. Uh, whereas Subject 15, it was that if you put the that if you put a pregnant woman in the animus, then there are, there are memories. You can re- live the, the baby's father's memories, which is a different idea. So when, so when he was hiding the apple in Brotherhood, was he remembering fighting Cesare? And is that why when you throw Cesare off the wall, this was the other part of his question, like it's very, like there's a lot of animus effects going on when that happens. It looks kind of corrupted, as he said. Is that what's going on there? Because it transitions yeah. immediately from that to him putting the apple down. Yeah. Yes, exactly. What's going on is he's he's using the the piece of Eden and he's remembering what happened, and the whole game takes place in that memory. Ah, uh, okay. Well, and that's I, why and that's why the very game the game begins with the beginning of the fight with Cesare because that's yeah. what's that's the memory they're trying to access. And then while he's fighting with Cesare, he remembers the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, go ahead, Phil. Go ahead. No, no. I I would like I would have wanted to add that the apple was yep. hidden in 1506. Well, Cesare, well, well, Ezio fought Cesare in 1507. But uh, yeah, Jeffrey's there's, last there's memory. There's memories within memories within memories. So yeah, it's like... I thought I thought he was remembering Cesare's fight while he was hiding the apple, but it was the other way around. No, 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 no. He is. He is remembering Cesare's fight while he's hiding the apple. But then, while he's remembering Cesare's fight, within Cesare's fight, he's remembering the beginning. Uh-huh. So it's that's why it's <laughs> boxes within boxes within boxes. It's we need to mem- go deeper. Memory inception. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. So it's 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 like Inception. It's three layers deep. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, my head. So, 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 <laughs> I'm pretty sure when I was playing the game, my eyes just kind of glazed over all that. <laughs> but what, what happens when he throws Cesare to his death is it pulls back to the actual memory, which is of him hiding the piece of Eden in 1506. Yeah. yeah okay. I get it. All right. That makes a lot more sense now. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is from I Need My Insides from the UK. And this is also another... <laughs> Um, yeah, I know the names, right? Um, this is another kind of revelations one, but it's kind of regarding kind of modern day stuff. So I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but he asks, what is the significance of the two remaining gateways on Animus Island at the end of ACR? Right. So the gateways were where you would enter Desmond's journey and there were a couple unused ones. Yeah, that, that had to do with a hint about the DLC. Ah, uh, right. Okay. It was just a hint okay. because I actually thought that was where, you know, when you started the Lost Archive, you just go up to those and then they'd be usable. So, mm-hmm. so is that a remnant of back when you were supposed to be living through the Lost Archive as Desmond, as you said before? And so it would actually be, you would actually go through there as Desmond and relive Clay's memories? Is that, was that the idea? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, let's see. All right, so we have a question from, I'm going to totally butcher this name, but it's Hiram Abiff. Okay, I, I hope that was somewhat correct, but he asked... Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff. Okay, <laughs> I apologize. He asks, near the end of the Lost Archive, you are brought through a room with a broken column and a tree. What is the significance of these items as it relates to the game? Thanks in advance. Uh, that you'll, you'll definitely... I, I'm sorry, but that's a, a question for Darby. Oh, right, okay. Oh, okay. All right, so let me just hit a couple more before we wrap this up. Um, 
It's telling us that we're going to be jumping through trees in AC3. So yeah. <laughs> get to know your trees. Climbing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, maybe just like two more. Okay, so this next one is from another name I'm going to butcher. Um, Tigger Maji or something. It's from Indonesia. I apologize for butchering the name. Um, and they're from Indonesia, and they ask, in one of their conversations after sequence two in ACR, Clay asked Desmond to take him out of the Animus to find another body. Uh, and then he asks if Animus 3.0 can realize the hopes. But I mean, we kind of kind of talked about this, but I thought maybe you could talk about that idea of um, Clay leaving the Animus in someone else's body. Uh, it's think. possible, and it's it exists in our world, so it's possible. Okay. okay. Lucy, <laughs> that's how she can come back. Her <laughs> 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 and Clay in one body accidentally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> all right so maybe we'll hit one more and then we'll, we'll wrap this up and this is kind of um not quite related to lost archive but i thought it was kind of interesting and maybe you might know the answer to this um this is also from i need my insights from the uk who asks who is responsible for writing and coordinating into the larger story arc project legacy in the abstergo website and will either of these be re revisited in the future and if not why were they terminated um, definitely. I mean, it was our first foray into Facebook games. And, uh, again, the brand is in charge of all of it. Corey's watching over it. Uh, we all really make sure, you know, I was brought in to make sure that the lore all matched. So it's really, uh, it's really a core project of ours. And, um, you'll see more online stuff in the future, most definitely. Okay, great. So it would, would it be mainly you that was responsible for writing and, and coordinating that? No, I did not write it. Uh, some very talented writers that work for us, like Richard Fernays, wrote it. Um, but and and Ethan Petty. But um, I I was brought in for the artifact stuff, and you know both both Corey and I make sure, or and Stefan Blay, who's actually uh, very much involved with the brand since the beginning, and Jean Gaston. Jean Guidon, there are a lot of, uh, of people who um, have been here since the very beginning um, that uh, make sure that everything uh, matches okay. the lore. So uh, no project that we really take on is is to the side or not canon unless, um, unless uh, it's, I guess, it's being pirated or something. <laughs> <laughs> Pirate developed, developed by pirates. <laughs> like the privateer and the Corsair. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Oh. Well, uh, I think that's going to pretty much wrap things up. So I want to thank all our guests for joining us, and especially Jeffrey for taking the time to talk to all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> You're welcome. Well, and I, I just also wanted to say that if you like the interpersonal story going on in the DLC, uh, be sure to check out uh, Far Cry 3, which... Um, is going to come out soon yeah. uh, because it's really uh, I've taken that kind of dynamic up a notch and it's it's going to be you know it's it's kind of like an AC game in first person <laughs> awesome in the sense that or like I guess like Red Dead Redemption was a little bit too yeah. you know that we're really doing something story driven and uh, rich and interesting and it's um, it's not just going to be about shooting people Cool. Check out be joining another wiki. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should spruce it up a little. Yeah, we'll definitely look forward to that. So uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Um, be sure to check us all out on you know our YouTube channels, various social media sites. We'll put uh, links in the video description for all that. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Yeah, thank bye. you very bye. much, everybody. Thank bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.